snowy Monday morning even impacting President Biden. The stairway he uses to get off Air Force One briefly got stuck in all the snow. A short time later, President Biden blasted by wind and snow deplaning Air Force One. That snow impacting the South and Mid-Atlantic. That snow impacting the South and Mid-Atlantic. Alabama saw temperatures in the 80s yesterday and snow today. Beach towns up and down the Jersey Shore getting lashed by wind and snow. What's coming next? Our Ginger Z is timing it all out. And that weather and dramatic surge of COVID cases is still causing travel headaches tonight. Thousands of flights canceled over the past few days. What are your rights if your flight gets moved? And what can you try to do to avoid getting stuck? Tonight, the major increase in COVID-19 cases as we enter the first work week of 2022. And just as students return to school following the holiday break, the FDA authorizes booster shots for children ages 12 to 15 as we deal with the massive long lines again to get tested. And one of the largest testing companies in the country now says results could take up to three days. Following major pushback, Dr. Anthony Fauci tells ABC News the CDC is considering a significant change to its guidance about when it's safe to leave isolation. The new information we're learning tonight about the January 6th investigation just days before America marks one year since the insurrection at the Capitol. The House committee with firsthand accounts of what then President Trump was doing as the violence unfolded and who tried to get him to take action to stop it. And as we approach that grim milestone, our journey to the small Virginia town where two active police officers were among those charged in storming the Capitol. Their alleged involvement has left that town deeply divided, but both sides hope that faith will help them come together. To grow some flowers, you gotta disturb the dirt. So this has been a disturbing year, just like 2020 was. But I believe in growth and it comes through sometimes seeing things messed up for a little bit. The heartwarming reunion between an NHL staffer and the aspiring doctor that helped save his life after spotting a cancerous mole from the stands. I just held it up to the plexiglass and just knocked. And our conversation with rap legend Daryl DMC McDaniels, his inspiring message for us all. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It is a new year. Many of us have the same old concerns. We begin tonight with the havoc as the holidays come to a close. The surging Omicron variant is really disrupting nearly all aspects of life. An average of 400,000 Americans are now testing positive for COVID-19 each day. Those are the highest levels of the entire pandemic. Businesses are forced to confront major staffing shortages. Those staffing shortages are really hitting the airline industry incredibly hard. And that, along with severe weather, has canceled thousands of flights every day for the past few days. And as millions of children go back to school, there's major concern about COVID outbreaks in the classroom. The second largest school district in the country, Los Angeles, delayed classes by a day to ask all students and staff to get tested. Today, the FDA authorized booster shots for teens 12 to 15 hospitalizations are once again on the rise tonight but doctors on the front lines tell ABC News the sickest of the sick are patients who are not vaccinated and there is serious concern about the rise in COVID cases among children under the age of five who remain unvaccinated but not by choice Trevor all leads us off tonight tonight millions of students starting the new year back in the classroom with COVID cases exploding Today, the FDA authorizing Pfizer booster shots for 12 to 15 year olds and regulators now recommending everybody 12 and up originally vaccinated with Pfizer get their booster after five months instead of six. It's more important now than ever for all teens to go out there and get all three of their vaccinations. America is now averaging 400,000 cases a day, up a staggering 200 percent in the past two weeks. School districts like Atlanta, Cleveland and Milwaukee switched to remote learning for the time being, but the nation's biggest district, New York City, today welcoming back students in person, handing out upgraded masks and ramping up testing as New York City's new mayor vows to keep kids in the classroom. We are going to keep our schools open. But many parents don't agree, some refusing to send their kids to school, others anxious dropping them off this morning. I'm just like worried, really worried for my kid because he has asthma. And I have cancer, so, you know, it's like a double whammy. How do you feel coming back to school today? Well, I don't think it's the right decision on the part of the administration. 
In Chicago, FedEx drop boxes overflowing with return test kits that some parents say couldn't be processed in time for the start of school. How can I let, allow my children to come back and they don't even have a negative or it's a positive result? Testing giant Quest Diagnostics tells ABC recent demand has stretched their average processing time to two or three days, and the testing crunch may only be growing. This line today in Worcester, Massachusetts, crowds including parents and their children braving bitter cold. And tonight, after backlash over the new CDC recommendations cutting isolation time in half to five days with no negative tests needed, Dr. Anthony Fauci now signaling the guidelines are under review yet again. There has been some concern about why we don't ask people at that five-day period to get tested. That is something that is now under consideration. The CDC is very well aware that there has been some pushback about that. Once again, more than 100,000 Americans are now in the hospital with COVID, a number expected to climb. And while some are learning they're positive at the hospital, the vast majority are being treated for the virus. Nearly all in the ICU at New Orleans Children's Hospital are too young to be vaccinated. Sadly, some of them are, gonna, are going to die. And... Um... And the tragedy of this is that almost all of those cases that result in hospitalization and death are preventable with vaccination. At Texas Children's, a third of patients are under five, including several babies with COVID. In South Carolina, Tyler Jones and his wife are boosted, but their three-month-old Addison, who's too young to get the vaccine, got sick with COVID New Year's Eve. He woke up in the middle of the night crying and having trouble breathing and he had a fever and you feel helpless because you know your three-month-old can't communicate what hurts i mean there's nothing scarier as a parent our hearts certainly go out to those parents and family members who are in the throes of all of this trevor alt joins us now trevor let's go back to the fda authorizing those booster shots for 12 to 15 year olds what's the timeline here when could we see those shots administered so, Lindsay, a CDC panel is first going to be meeting on Wednesday to make a recommendation. And once Dr. Walensky, the director, signs off on that plan, then things can move very quickly. We actually could see these first booster doses for Pfizer given to 12 to 15 year olds as early as Thursday. Lindsay. Oh, very soon. All right, Trevor Alt, our thanks to you. For many who travel by plane over the holidays, it has simply been a nightmare. A raging pandemic during a brutal winter snap is now impacting staffing and causing thousands of flights to be canceled. We've seen travelers and airline workers starting to run out of patience. ABC's Gio Benitez has this report. Tonight, that monster winter storm slamming the East Coast just as the Omicron variant causes a slew of airline staffing issues, creating the perfect storm for a travel nightmare in the air and on the roads. In Virginia alone, more than 500 crashes, heavy, wet snow falling throughout the Washington, D.C. metro area. The visibility is, is extremely bad, and the road is absolutely snow-covered. Across the country, more than 3,000 flights canceled today. Even Air Force One wasn't spared. Workers struggling to free one of the stairways to get passengers off the plane. President Biden on board, returning to Joint Base Andrews in the middle of the storm. At Reagan National Airport outside D.C., cancellations piling up. Our Kenneth Moten is there. It's been a day of de-icing planes and snow plows on the runways. More than 300 cancellations here at Reagan Airport, the most in the country. Aisha and Demir Crawford trying to get to South Carolina. I'm tired. I'm drained. I'm ready to go home. More than 8,000 flights canceled in the U.S. since New Year's Day. We just need to get home, so we, uh, we got in a car, a rental car, and started driving. Ian and Alexa Harrison visiting New Orleans for the holiday, driving more than a thousand miles back to their Michigan home after their flight was canceled Saturday. So many people in a similar boat. Gio Benitez joins us now from the airport. Gio, what do airlines think in terms of staffing and schedules starting to get back on track? So, Lindsay, it's not good news. With this Omicron variant raging and flight crews testing positive, these airlines, they are warning that this issue may not be resolved anytime soon, let's see. Still a while to go. All right, Gio Benitez, our thanks to you. And let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, who is timing out the storm and cold blast behind it. We see they're blowing in the wind. Good evening to you, Ginger. 
Yes. Oh my goodness. We've seen gusts from 20 to 25 miles per hour. It is making it feel so much colder. January coming in saying I am no joke and I am going to feel like winter. Unlike much of what we've dealt with in the last couple of weeks, we've had record highs down along the Gulf Coast all the way through the plains. This will not be that. So let's go ahead and dive into it because we saw snow and we're talking more than a foot of snow for a lot of people in Appalachia. Hunting town uh, Maryland came away with more than 15 inches, but that storm is off the coast now, just kind of tickling the cape there. It's all about the cold air, and you, you, you can't look anywhere except Florida and not find wind chills that are somewhere around freezing or well below. I mean, Bismarck 8 below, that's not a surprise, but check out Flagstaff to Albuquerque over to Mobile, Alabama, that will be sub freezing by tomorrow morning, and everybody taking that big tumble. Now, there is another storm that's coming in for the West. We've seen a significant uh, impact in the positive way for the drought in California and less than 1% in that highest level of exceptional drought all within one week. But for the Cascades, this is going to be a problematic two to three feet falling pretty quickly in the next couple of days with that storm. And then it introduces us to another Arctic blast. I think it is time for me to acclimate to winter. Yes, <laughs> January means business here. Not playing with us at all. Ginger, yeah. thank you. Stay warm or get warm, I should say. Yes. <laughs> Thursday marks one year since the January 6th assault on the Capitol. Members of the House Committee investigating the attack are now revealing the testimony they've already received about what former President Trump was doing during the siege and about his daughter Ivanka's reported attempts to get him to act to stop the mob. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. The January 6th committee has now spoken to people who were at the White House with Donald Trump the day his supporters attacked the Capitol. And the top Republican on the committee says they now know what the former president was up to as the chaos unfolded. The committee has first-hand testimony now that he was sitting in the dining room next to the Oval Office watching the attack on television. Uh, as, as the assault on the Capitol occurred. Citing that firsthand testimony, Cheney says Trump made no effort to stop the violence. The White House briefing room was right down the hall, but he made no statement condemning the riot. That morning before the riot, Ivanka Trump was backstage at the rally where her father made his now infamous speech. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Witnesses have now told the committee Ivanka Trump would later plead with her father to do something to call off the rioters. We have firsthand testimony uh, that his daughter Ivanka uh, went in at least twice uh, to ask him to please stop this violence. The committee previously revealed Donald Trump Jr. texted Chief of Staff Mark Meadows again and again that day to urge his father to act. He's got to condemn this expletive ASAP. He texted, we need an Oval Office address. He has to lead now. It has gone too far and gotten out of hand. Really urging the then president to take some kind of action. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Capitol Hill. John, we know President Biden is expected to speak on January 6th, but former President Trump will also mark the day. What are their plans? President Trump is holding what he is calling a press conference down in Mar-a-Lago uh, on January 6th. Uh, he seems to be hoping this will be a platform, an opportunity for him to again repeat what he has been saying about the election, really the same lies that led to the attack in the first place. As for other Republicans, they are, for the most part, going to remain quiet, Lindsay. There are uh, no plans for Republican leaders in Capitol Hill to take part in the events uh, commemorating January 6th here on Capitol Hill. In fact, uh, most of them do not plan to be in Washington on that day. Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you. Thank you, Lindsay. For more on the January 6th investigation and the upcoming one-year mark, we bring in Texas Representative Joaquin Castro. Thank you so much for your time, Congressman. Thanks for having me. And we'll get to the latest news in just a moment. But first, let's look back nearly a year ago during the insurrection. You went into lockdown with your staffers. What was that moment like? And, and how close were you to, to coming face to face with that mob? Well, I mean, the whole day was uh, just chaotic. And we were locked in in the Capitol complex. We couldn't get out. And um, looking back, I didn't understand the severity of the threat that day as it was unfolding. And I was in my office at Rayburn with my you know, several staff members, but we didn't know if that mob was gonna come into the house office buildings. There were people there were, that were from Texas. I didn't know if they were gonna come look for me, just like the other members of Congress from their own states, I'm sure had the same concern. Um, and so it, you know, obviously it's a moment and a day that's forever etched in my memory. 
And you know, most of all, as a Congress, we have to do everything we can to be sure that it never happens again to our country. And the January 6th committee now says that the attack on the Capitol was likely a coordinated effort. If that is the case, how would that change this investigation? Well, I think everybody that was part of the coordinated effort needs to be held accountable. And so I'm glad to see Benny Thompson, the chairman of the January 6th Select Committee, uh, being aggressive with people who have information that's relevant to the investigation, but are refusing to come before the committee. I'm glad that he referred Steve Bannon and Mark Meadows uh, for contempt of Congress to the Justice Department. I hope that quick action will be taken on that. And most of all, I hope that everybody else who is called to, to cooperate will cooperate uh, and that everybody will be held accountable, including, by the way, any members of Congress who knowingly participated or coordinated with this dangerous mob. And what do you make of claims that then-President Trump ignored pleas to calm the crowd down, coming from his daughter Ivanka, son Don Jr., and Congressman Kevin McCarthy? Uh, I mean, it's truly sick. Uh, it's truly sick that the president of the United States, who at any time could have told these people to stand down and to leave the Capitol, uh, might have been, and it appears, was sitting and watching this violence occur, uh, an attack on the American government, and for many hours did absolutely nothing. Even though the people closest to him in his life were begging him to say something and to do something, it's absolutely remarkable. Uh, and sad to think about, but also absolutely true. And, and Congressman, of course, you're also a lawyer. You were in a, a House impeachment manager in the second impeachment trial of Trump, where he was acquitted of incitement of insurrection. Do you think President Trump committed any crimes on January 6th? And if so, do you predict that he'll be held accountable? Well, I mean, certainly he, you know, he inflamed the situation by his rhetoric, by the big lie, uh, and then made it worse by not taking action as commander in chief. And so I hope that the January 6th Select Committee will get to the bottom of that, his exact role. Um, you know, they, they are doing everything that they can to get all the information about his actions on that day and even before that day. Uh, and so I'll leave that final question or answer, I guess, to the Department of Justice. Uh, but I think the average American, knowing that the president of the United States told a big lie, inflamed all these people to go attack the Capitol, and then sat there and watched it unfold, uh, while it was going on and didn't lift a finger to help. You know, most people think that somebody like that did something wrong. And I want to follow up on that because many legal analysts have warned that the January 6th panel referring a former president for criminal charges, particularly with a Democratic-controlled Congress, could set a dangerous precedent. Does that concern you at all? Uh, of course, the kind of precedent that we set absolutely concerns me. You know, and we've watched as presidents and former leaders of other countries have been tried and convicted for different crimes. And as Americans, you know, there's always a sense in us that, hey, our democracy is beyond that, or we don't have to worry about that, or we're somehow more civilized than that. Uh, but here you have a commander in chief, the most powerful person in the country and on earth, most powerful politician, who was stoking the flames of division and hatred uh, and telling a big lie to the point where his, some of his supporters went out there and attacked the United States government. Uh, and then he did nothing about it. Uh, there is a greater danger, I think, in taking no action when a president behaves that way, because the greater danger is that a future president, really a Republican or Democrat, a liberal or conservative, could one day decide to do the same thing, knowing that nobody is going to take action when they do. And Congressman, one year later, the country, as you know, remains deeply divided over the events of January 6th. In fact, a recent ABC News poll found that while a strong majority of Americans condemn the attack and believe that former President Trump is at least partially to blame, one in four Americans has the opposite view. And they say that uh, these individuals were actually protecting democracy. How do you think that we move forward as a nation with this kind of division? And is it perhaps a risk that the Democrats will, will make this event all about Trump to their peril? Well, I think this is about democracy and protecting and saving our democracy. That's why we have focused on uh, making sure that the Congress, including the Senate now, passes the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act so that we protect our democracy and we have free and fair elections going forward. Um, but look, you know, you're right. There's a uh, significant part of the country, 25 percent, uh, that believes that 
uh, that there was nothing wrong with what happened on January 6. And many of people that believe that Donald Trump was right, they believe in the big lie. And I think most of all, that speaks to the power of disinformation in American society today. And we all have to do a better job of combating that. Congressman Joaquin Castro, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate it. Thank you. When we come back, a verdict in the Elizabeth Holmes case. Rebecca Jarvis is standing by with the details. Daryl DMC McDaniel of Run DMC fame joins us. He has more on why some of the things that people perceive as making us weak can actually be what make us strong. And our journey to one community where two officers sworn to protect the community are now accused of January 6th crimes. And it's opening up some tough conversations about race, politics, and our country. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. Where the sky... He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay, this is the moment. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Unbelievable story. She was so excited. It was going to be a beautiful wedding. 911. Oh my God. I don't think she's alive. Molly Watson's body was found wearing her engagement ring. I never would have thought that I would have been going to her funeral that next week. This is a story of a man who was living a double life. What has he been hiding? Now, stunning details. There's one piece of smoking gun evidence a cell phone. The new 2020 event special, Friday night on ABC. Take a look at this dramatic rescue that took place in Oregon over the weekend. Two 19-year-olds hoisted to safety by the Coast Guard after signaling for help by writing SOS in the snow. Both men went camping around Christmas on Swastika Mountain. For those who are making a connection, the word swastika is no relation to the Nazis. But I digress. Both men were trapped by heavy snow and then found on New Year's. 
Now to breaking news. We do have a verdict in the fraud trial of Elizabeth Holmes, founder of Theranos. Here to give us the very latest is ABC's Rebecca Jarvis, host of The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial podcast. Rebecca, thanks so much for joining us. So the jurors found Holmes guilty on four of 11 counts. Walk us through what they determined. So, Lindsay, they determined on many of the counts involving investors that Elizabeth Holmes was guilty, but when it came to patients, they found her not guilty. And there were an additional three charges where they delivered no verdict. And this was a jury that was deadlocked throughout the day today. We received a note from them earlier in the day telling Judge Davila, the judge, the presiding judge in this case, that they couldn't come to a conclusion, they could not come to a unanimous verdict on three of the charges impacting investors investors and they asked repeatedly throughout the day for a second time whether or not they could deliver a verdict on the other charges. Well, ultimately, Judge Davila had them go back, had them complete their verdict forms. And Lindsay, as we have it here tonight, you said it, four guilty charges, four charges where Elizabeth Holmes was found guilty. Those are the charges that involve misleading investors and wire fraud. But the charges involving patients, if you'll remember, this was a technology, the Theranos technology that Elizabeth Holmes created that was supposed to be able to revolutionize blood testing. It found its way into Walgreens stores. And throughout this trial, we heard from some of the patients who received those tests, a woman who thought she had miscarried inaccurately because of a Theranos test, she said. An individual who believed she may have HIV because of a Theranos test. And an individual who thought he might have prostate cancer because of a Theranos test. In all of those patient cases, the jury has come back with a verdict today of not guilty, Lindsay. And I realize that it's still early and we may not have any clues or indications yet, but do we know at all the sticking points that, that they had as far as those counts that they were, they were deadlocked on or the acquittals? Well, it's still... It's, it's still too early to tell, but what we can say is, particularly when it came to those patient counts, the number of steps that the jury would have to go through in order to connect Elizabeth Holmes herself to the allegations of fraud were deeper. They were farther than some of the allegations involving investors. And when you look at the wire fraud, this is a question of wire fraud. This is not a question of malpractice. This was not a question of how patients received their tests. It was a question of the wire fraud that led them to go and seek out Theranos testing and how Theranos was advertised to them. We heard in court throughout this hearing uh, a number of investors who took the stand who talked very specifically about what they were explicitly told by Elizabeth Holmes. We heard tapes played. Uh, one investor, for example, Brian Tolbert, he surreptitiously recorded an investor call with Elizabeth Holmes. That was played in court. And by the way, Lindsay, this jury asked to hear that replayed to them during the deliberations, his count has come back as a guilty count in this verdict. And, and so what happens now going forward? What does all of this mean for the former Silicon Valley darling? Well, each of these counts comes with up to 20 years of prison time, and we still have to await sentencing at this point. That could be many weeks from now. Elizabeth Holmes received this verdict in the courtroom, sitting between her two attorneys and as well her family in the courtroom, her partner, uh, Billy Evans, who she recently had a new child with. Uh, that child, as of today, is about six months old. So this is something where she will now await sentencing. The judge will certainly take into account, and we've spoken to a number of legal experts about this, the judge will take into account her background, the fact that this is the first uh, criminal act that she's been accused of. It is unlikely, according to the legal experts that we've spoken to, that she will ultimately get that 20-year prison sentence. But given these guilty counts, it is very likely that Elizabeth Holmes, who's now 37 years old and a mom of a six-month-old child, will be facing prison time, Lindsay. Wow. Okay, Rebecca Jarvis, just excellent coverage throughout the whole trial. We thank you so much. Thank you. Still ahead here on Prime, the hockey fan who helped save a stranger's life, what she spotted and why it made all the difference. And the gut punch that none of us needed as we said goodbye and farewell to 2021. We take a look at the life of beloved actress Betty White and her incredible career by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, the Department of Interior with this spot on post of how so many of us feel going back to work today.
extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. <laughs> Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. Well, just hours before the new year and just weeks before she would have turned 100, one of America's most beloved entertainers, the iconic Betty White, passed away. We learned late today that she died of natural causes. Tonight, we take a look at her incredible achievements on and off screen by the numbers. Betty White was many things, including a trailblazer. She was the first woman to produce a national TV show, the first woman to star in a sitcom, the first producer to hire a female director, and the first woman to receive an Emmy nomination. And let's keep up that number one, because she was also the first woman to ever appear on television, given her performance on an experimental broadcast in the late 1930s. For more than 60 years, she graced our television screens with her wit, charm, and enduring lovability from playing a TV host on the Mary Tyler Moore Show to the clueless Rose Nyland in the Golden Girls to Elka on Hot in Cleveland and so much more. She was a six-time Emmy Award winner and in 1988, White was honored with a star on the Walk of Fame. Off camera, White was a devoted animal rights advocate and worked with the Los Angeles Zoo beginning in 1966. Decades later, she was named an honorary zookeeper. The legendary Betty White would have turned 100 on January 7th we were lucky to have had her for just shy of a century. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The rescue after more than a dozen spend a night in frigid conditions. And hard to be under pressure after a multi-million dollar payday. First, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Anytime. 
Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. More protection against COVID-19 now available for more Americans with the FDA authorizing Pfizer's booster shot for 12 to 15 year olds. Top agency officials saying the third dose is safe for that age group, adding risk of the rare heart condition myocarditis will be extremely rare. In the setting of a tremendous number of uh, Omicron and Delta cases in this country, the potential benefits of getting vaccinated in this age range outweigh uh, that, that risk. This as millions of children go back to school after the holidays. Cities like Chicago, Boston, and New York tightening COVID safety measures to try and keep everyone safe. Other cities like Atlanta, Milwaukee, and Newark are going remote temporarily. Former President Trump's eldest son and daughter are refusing to comply with subpoenas from the New York State Attorney General's office, which has a civil investigation into the way the family real estate business valued its holdings. A court document shows Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka Trump will file motions to try to stop the subpoenas as soon as today. The Attorney General's investigation is running parallel with the criminal investigation currently underway by Manhattan District Attorney's office. A frightening moments on a tram in New Mexico. Nearly two dozen people needed to be rescued when they got stuck during freezing conditions. Amber Santos says at first, the mood was festive. Good Happy New Year's, guys! By 4 a.m., though, they got even more bad news. Rescuers couldn't respond until at least daybreak. It's freezing, the condensation on the roof from all those breathing was turning into icicles. We were swinging back and forth like a, like a swing. Finally, at around 9.30 a.m., about 12 hours later, Amber says the first rescuer reached their tram. Search and rescue yeah, team. Amber says the rescuers attaching a rope to a pole in the middle of the tram. One by one, they harnessed us in. Well, in the end, the rescue mission was a success, and all 21 people made it safely to the ground. 
heart-pounding moment caught on camera as skiers rush to rescue a dog trapped in an avalanche for more than 20 minutes. You okay, man? We're coming, buddy. His nose was probably like, I could just see the top of his nose. The frantic moments unfolding the day after Christmas. 22-year-old Bobby White taking out his new GoPro camera with his friend Josh Trujillo to do some backcountry skiing in Colorado. But without any cracking or warning, an avalanche broke. According to a preliminary report on the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, the dog owner was out skiing with a friend and his dog Apollo, seen here moments before the avalanche. Josh spotted in Apollo's nose sticking out from the snow and started digging frantically. You okay, buddy? A little scared? A little scared and very cold, but amazingly emerging from feet of snow unharmed. The boss may be setting a trend as David Bowie's estate becomes the latest to sell a Legends publishing catalog. Reports say Warner Chapel Music bought the catalog for a price upwards of $250 million. The agreement comprises songs from his 26 studio albums released during his lifetime, as well as the posthumous studio album, which comes out on Friday. Some of the hit songs include Heroes, Space Oddity, Ziggy Stardust, and his collab with Queen, Under Pressure. This comes just weeks after Springsteen sold his entire catalog to Sony Music for half a billion dollars. Welcome back. Tonight, as we approach the one-year mark of the deadly riot at the U.S. Capitol, we travel to a small town, 260 miles outside of D.C., where the impact of that day is still being deeply felt. Rocky Mount, Virginia, is home to two of the three active police officers who federal authorities have now charged in the storming of the Capitol building. Their involvement has deeply divided the town and resurfaced long-running debates over race, history, and politics. So where do they go from here? ABC's Devin Dwyer went there to find out. The chaos that stunned the world on January 6th had roots in sleepy southern towns like Rocky Mount, Virginia. In the quiet foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, where moonshine and bluegrass are king and symbols of Donald Trump and the Confederacy are immortal. We just accept it and we just, just take it for what it is. This is their land, this is their county and we just live in it. Rocky Mount is predominantly white and politically conservative. The passions poured out in the Capitol riot were no surprise here, but the involvement of two of their own sent shockwaves through the town. Jacob Fracker and Thomas Robertson, seen here making an obscene statement in a selfie from inside the Capitol, are two of just three active police officers that federal authorities have charged for their alleged actions that day. I think it was actually shocking Everyone I've talked to was totally shocked that those two men would do that. On social media, the Rocky Mount cops, both military veterans, celebrated their participation. Robertson saying they attacked the government to stand up for their rights. Fracker saying on Facebook, I can protest for what I believe in. I, I could not believe what I was seeing. Like, seriously. I Rocky Mount believe. native Bridget Craighead says she considered the officers family. But we were out here in the front. We had it was people. months earlier that they stood in solidarity at the town's first protest for Black Lives Matter. <laughs> Cell phone video capturing the cops dancing with the demonstrators. They were killing the electric slide. I mean, I'm going to say. But I really felt like we were uh, the example of what a community needs to do to get through this type of trauma. Do you consider them something? friends? We were. I, and when we saw each other, hey, how you doing? This is a small town. <laughs> but January 6th was a betrayal of that friendship, she says, seen in their participation at the Capitol, elements of racism and white power. Craighead led calls to get the officers fired. They needed to be exposed because it's, it's not only just them. They're just the body of the evil here. It's, a, it's, it's, it's deeper than the two officers. If you got some time with Jacob Fracker and Thomas Robertson today and you sat down with them face to face, what would you tell them? Was it worth it? Was it worth it? Robertson and Fracker have pleaded not guilty to federal charges of disorderly and disruptive conduct and obstruction of Congress, insisting they didn't participate in violence that day and that their message is not incompatible with support for black lives. They both were 
very um, polite gentlemen, um, and they were both town police officers. However, it is unfortunate that they are no longer employees of the town. Tyler Lee considers the now former officers his friends. At 29, he's the youngest person ever elected to Rocky Mount City Council, and he spent the past year trying to urge his neighbors to turn the page. I think we have to leave the stuff in the, a year ago, a year ago, because if we keep bringing up what happened a year ago, it's still gonna keep punching us in the mouth, right? If we can just teach compassion, communication, and how to balance a checkbook, those three things, I think you're golden. But beneath the surface, emotions are still raw. People like to fantasize, I call it, saying, you know, it's a good old southern town and all the families get along and everybody's happy, et cetera. And I call that the fantasy. School board member Penny Blue says the riot resurfaced divisions over race, history, and politics that date to the Civil War and rekindled her disgust with Confederate symbols like this memorial statue, which was erected just 10 years ago after an older version was damaged. I don't admire the Confederate dead. Do you see what happened on 1-6 as an extension of the Confederacy? I do. It was an insurrection, and that's what these people did. It was an insurrection. Trump did not radicalize these people. He took advantage of what was already here. When I say here, I mean in Franklin County in America. This part of the area is dominated by Trump's supporters. He still looms large here, even a year after leaving office. Voters here last fall broke heavily for pro-Trump Republican Glenn Youngkin for governor in a campaign dominated by debate over critical race theory. The town also tapping a new, more conservative representative to the State House of Delegates, a former member of Trump's 2020 legal team who fought the election results. You must never have been cheated by somebody. Some of these people will, will go to their grave holding that grudge forever. I was the Ren Williams, whose family has deep ties to this community, faced off against Bridget Craighead in November and won in a landslide. Church and God is a big thing for us. History, as you said, we steeped in history. And we feel as though um, people who don't understand our way of life or they don't resonate or connect with us, they, they dismiss it and they think it's less than. Did you consider the events of 1-6 at the U.S. Capitol an attack on the government? How do you view what took place there? I personally view it as a riot, and I condemn all rioting. I condemn what we saw in January 6th and going into the Capitol and things like that. Go out into these small towns and actually see if anybody is talking about January 6th anymore, because they're not. They're not discussing it. Williams is convinced Trump will run for president again. Others in the community wait anxiously for word on his intentions. At Rocky Mount United Methodist, the political divide is evident in the pews. If you have any hope of healing, you got to talk about what's hurting. So how do you bridge the divide between those two groups of people who sit in your pews? I tend to believe that honesty is the best policy. Ripping off the Band-Aids, the best way to move forward. So we talk about it. Um, we're unafraid here. A willingness to keep talking to each other, that's one rare area of common ground we found in the divided town. We're bringing up all these hurtful topics and subjects, not to rub it you know, in your face or to bring up the past, but we have to bring up the past to learn from it and to move on and to heal. At the end of the day, we all may disagree, but you still have to be able to stick your hand out and, and face it as a champ as both sides of the debate in Rocky Mount say it's faith that will see the town through. To grow some flowers, you gotta disturb the dirt. So this has been a disturbing year, just like 2020 was, but I believe in growth and it comes through sometimes seeing things messed up for a little bit. For ABC News, I'm Devin Dwyer in Rocky Mount, Virginia. Sometimes you have to disturb the dirt. Our thanks to Devin for that. And now to a heartwarming story from a hockey game. You're about to meet a fan who helped save the life of an equipment manager on the bench simply by noticing something on his neck. ABC's Will Reeve has this story. Vancouver Canucks equipment manager Brian Red Hamilton is lucky to be alive after 22-year-old aspiring physician Nadia Popovich spotted a cancerous mole on Red's neck from the stands. I put mole, doctor, and cancer in red <laughs> and uh, made them bold. I just held it up to the plexiglass and just knocked. Like if she went this far, I don't know her. I don't know what she knows. I don't know anything about her. 
I need to get this checked. This is the one time I'm going to see this man possibly. And he, you know, those things can be very fatal. A call from his doctor confirmed Hamilton's worst fear. His line to me was, I'm going to diagnose you with cancer. I'm also going to tell you that you have an angel in your life because if you didn't get that thing out in five years, you would not be here. Nadia, what do you make of all that when you hear this? Oh, my gosh. I mean, just hearing that, I, I, I mean, I'm speechless. You don't have to be medically trained to spot a melanoma. You just have to look closely with your eyes and you need to speak up, right? It could actually save a life. Through Twitter, the Kraken and Canucks found Nadia and brought her to Saturday night's game. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. For a meeting with Red and a well-earned surprise from both teams. $10,000 toward her med school education. I almost talked myself out of it and I, it's just it's just the butterfly effect. I mean, seriously, it's so amazing. For decades, every time you hear the letters DMC, it's likely the image of classic Adidas sneakers with the three stripes and no laces coming to mind, along with the hip hop classic Walk This Way. But now those three letters can also be associated with a children's book author as Daryl DMC McDaniel's latest creation is titled Daryl Dreams, where he inspires kids to be creative, stay true to themselves, and find their voice. And I am very excited to welcome to the show Daryl DMC McDaniel's. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having us. Thank so let, let's start off with your creative process behind this book. How different is it to write a children's book compared to, to writing a song? Well, it's kind of like the same thing. Um, creatively, even with my music, I've always created stuff that would inspire and motivate people. But even more importantly, the things that I rapped about in my music, I, it would help people see things that was powerful about themselves. Like, for instance, when I rapped, I'm DMC in the place to be, I go to St. John's University. It was individuals that was like, yo, DMC goes to college? In college must be cool. When I rapped about my glasses, D's for doing it all of the time. M's for the rhymes that are all mine. C's for cool, cool as can be. And I wear my glasses so I can see. It was like I put glasses on a map and made people who thought they were just four eyes of binoculars and made them feel that they could be accepted and they could participate and they could be successful. So the same thing that goes into writing rhymes is the same thing that goes into writing the books because it's all true things about me as a person that people can relate to. You made glasses cool. And uh, yes. and we see the little boy, and this is actually you. I don't know, I think that people yes. yeah, can probably kind of see that here. This is you on the stage with glasses as a little boy. And, and this kind of struck me, this page, because somebody yells when you're mm -hmm. really just starting out, kind of doing a, a poem. I think it was before you even realized yes. you were rapping. And somebody shouts out, what a weirdo. But you didn't yes. let that stop you. You kept going. What kind of message would you like kids to, to take away who are reading this book? I want every kid to understand that they are perfect just the way that they are, and they have everything necessary for them to succeed. A lot of times, kids, and even us adults, when we worry about whatever people think, we tend to miss our purpose and our destiny. So I want kids to understand this story is not just about Daryl. I want them to see themselves and I want them to know that they can do anything that they want to do and they can be anything that they want to be. The King DMC, the mighty King of Rock, I used to get teased, bullied, and picked on too. But it wasn't until I believed in myself and I realized everything that people thought was corny about me is some of the most powerful things about me in the first place. Love that. And in your book, you also dream about finding your voice. There is a page where you say, suddenly Daryl found himself inside a recording studio. Daryl looked at one of the awards and saw himself. Looking back, exactly. do you think that the dream was always to be a rap artist? No, not at all. I didn't even want to write a kid's book. I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I was I was a straight A student and very proud of it, always on the honor roll. So when I graduated from high school, I made it to St. John's University. I was just fortunate that 
this rhyme writing, rap writing thing was just a good hobby of mine that I was very good at. And it took uh, Joseph Simmons, my partner, Reverend Run, he looked at what I was writing and he was like, yo, this is really good. But most likely it's really funny. If I wasn't in the music business, I probably would have been a teacher working with kids. So everything has gone full circle. I just don't want these boys and girls to be worried about what people think and not do what's on their hearts. And, and do you, switching gears for a moment, because you have been very frank about your battles with depression, substance abuse, and, and how you overcame those adversities. How do you explain your yes. journey of resilience to this, this new younger generation? Well, first of all, I want people to, re I want the younger generation to realize that within them is everything necessary for them to be successful. But at the same time, their situation doesn't define who they are. It's who they feel they should be, who they want to be, and the very things that they love and have desires and passion for that, that's going to help them be successful. But also, there's people put on this earth to help get them where they're supposed to go. Their mothers, fathers, relatives, teachers, um, um, counselors. There are so many people around them with a mission to help them fulfill their mission. And like, like in the book, we all going to face adversity. But it's believing in yourself and realizing some of the things that people might not like about you that's considered corny and not cool is actually some of the coolest things about you that is part of your successful journey here in this universe, just like little young DMC. Right, and I think that that's what is such a pertinent part of this message and poignant part of the book is be a weirdo, right? Really kind of encouraging yes. kids in that way. And before you leave us, can can we ask you to, to do us the honor of, of reciting a few lines from the last page of your book titled Daryl's Rap. Okay, you can call me Daryl, you can call me D. The initials of my name are DMC. Daryl McDaniels, yeah, that's my name. One day I'm going to be in the Hall of Fame. Since kindergarten, I've acquired the knowledge. After 12th grade, I'm going straight to college. I'm a nice kid from Hollis, Queens, and I love eating chicken and collard greens. I read comic books and I love to draw. I've been drawing superheroes since I was four. I get good grades and I love school. That's because education is very cool. I wear my glasses so I can see there's a lot of kids out there who are just like me. Oh, I love that you added the glasses right there. Love eating the chicken and collard greens. <laughs> Daryl, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Daryl's Dream is available tomorrow wherever books are sold. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. When a city becomes a winter wonderland, take a look at these two riding a sled down the snow-covered steps near the U.S. Capitol. The gentleman is actually from California and was going to go home, but like so many, his flight was canceled. So instead, he did something that he cannot do in San Jose. He went sledding. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. hour when COVID and Mother Nature strike. What do you do if you're just trying to get home? We speak with the travel guy about tips for so many who remain stuck. And it's that time of year where we make a promise to ourselves that many of us just end up breaking. But what if we were really serious this year about those resolutions? Where do we start? Stay with us. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen.
ABC News, honored winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the award for overall excellence in television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Tonight, leaders of the House Select Committee investigating the Capitol insurrection touting their progress as Biden prepares to address the nation on the one-year anniversary on Thursday. But Committee Chair Benny Thompson says months into the investigation, he believes multiple people, including members of Congress, were involved in a potentially coordinated effort to undermine U.S. democracy. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are responding to troubled wide receiver Antonio Antonio Brown's outburst, the star wide receiver, was cut from the team after stripping off his jersey and pads in the middle of the game yesterday. The Bucks coach says that he wishes Brown, who is no longer on the team, well and hopes he gets help. Brown posted a message saying, thanks for the opportunity. And tomorrow, you could wake up worth more than half a billion dollars or not. Tonight's Powerball jackpot continues to grow. The lump sum payment is around $400 million. No one has won it since October. Now to the post-holiday travel chaos and the thousands of flights getting canceled each day for several days. And this comes with carriers already grappling with a surge of COVID cases causing staffing shortages. ABC's Gio Benitez has the latest. Tonight, that monster winter storm slamming the East Coast just as the Omicron variant causes a slew of airline staffing issues, creating the perfect storm for a travel nightmare in the air and on the roads. In Virginia alone, more than 500 crashes, heavy, wet snow falling throughout the Washington, D.C. metro area. The visibility is, is extremely bad, and the road is absolutely snow-covered. Across the country, more than 3,000 flights canceled today. Even Air Force One wasn't spared. Workers struggling to free one of the stairways to get passengers off the plane. President Biden on board, returning to Joint Base Andrews in the middle of the storm. At Reagan National Airport outside D.C., cancellations piling up. Our Kenneth Moten is there. It's been a day of de-icing planes and snow plows on the runways. More than 300 cancellations here at Reagan Airport, the most in the country. Aisha and Demir Crawford trying to get to South Carolina. I'm tired. I'm drained. I'm ready to go home. More than 8,000 flights canceled in the U.S. since New Year's Day. We just need to get home, so we, uh, we got in a car, a rental car, and started driving. Ian and Alexa Harrison visiting New Orleans for the holiday, driving more than a thousand miles back to their Michigan home after their flight was canceled Saturday. And let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, who is timing out the storm and cold blast behind it. We see they're blowing in the wind. Good evening to you, Ginger. Yes, oh my goodness, we've seen gusts from 20 to 25 miles per hour. It is making it feel so much colder. January coming in saying, I am no joke, and I am going to feel like winter. Unlike much of what we've dealt with in the last couple of weeks, we've had record highs down along the Gulf Coast all the way through the plains. This will not be that. So let's go ahead and dive into it, because we saw snow, and we're talking more than a foot of snow for a lot of people in Appalachia, hunting town. Uh, Maryland came away with more than 15 inches, but that storm is off the coast now, just kind of tickling the cape there. It's all about the cold air, and you, you, you can't look anywhere except Florida and not find wind chills that are somewhere around freezing or well below. I mean, Bismarck 8 below, that's not a surprise, but check out Flagstaff to Albuquerque over to Mobile, Alabama, that will be sub-freezing by tomorrow morning, and everybody taking that big tumble. Now, there is another storm that's coming in for the west. We've seen a significant uh, impact in the positive way for the drought in California and less than 1% in that highest level of exceptional drought all within one week. But for the Cascades, this is going to be a problematic two to three feet falling pretty quickly in the next couple of days with that storm. And then it introduces us to another Arctic blast. I think it is time for me to acclimate to winter. Yes, <laughs> January means business here. Not playing with us at all. Ginger, yeah. thank you. Stay warm or get warm, I should say. <laughs> Now for more on the travel nightmares millions are facing tonight and what you can do if you are stuck 
Here is the points guy, Brian Kelly. Brian, thanks so much for joining us as always, and, and Happy New Year to you. Thank you. You too. So first off, why are we in this perfect storm, so to speak, of, of so many flights delaying or, or being canceled? Yeah, the biggest issue is this snowstorm that knocked out nearly 90% of flights out of D.C. today. And, you know, the airline industry has been reeling uh, with Omicron and staff shortages and even before that, pilot and crew shortages. So, you know, they simply haven't had a chance to breathe and reset. And hopefully this next storm gives them a little bit of time. But, you know, for the foreseeable future throughout January, travelers should expect interruptions and delays. And what do you do if you find out that your flight is delayed or canceled once you're already at the airport? Well, the first thing you want to do is get your phone out, download the airline app, and see if you can rebook yourself right away. The longer you wait in the line, whether that's in person or trying to get through the phone to the airline, you know, those seats get, you know, taken by the people in front of you. Uh, so if you have access to an airline lounge, I highly recommend you can go into the lounge and those agents can rebook you. Or if the phone lines, which to, to the U.S. numbers can be 12 hours long, try calling international numbers for the airlines. All the agents speak English and, you know, more often than not, the wait times are less. You can also, uh, you know, DM on social media as well. So you got to you got to take every angle possible to get through. Some smart options and you may have similar answers for this is what if your flight gets canceled and you're automatically rebooked on a flight, but you can't make that flight. And then you also can't get through to anyone due to the long call waits. What are your options at that point? So I say you, you cancel the flight, you will get a refund eventually, and you know, rebook yourself. Uh, use frequent flyer miles, even last minute, it can be a great value to redeem those miles. But also, if you booked your flight, there are a lot of credit cards out there that have what's called trip cancellation or interruption coverage. And if you booked on one of them, they can offer you up to $500 per ticket, uh, you know, for paying for those hotel rooms or the rental cars. So. You know, try to use every option possible when trying to recoup those losses. And if you need to get somewhere quickly and your current airline doesn't have any good options and, and you need to make a new reservation on a different airline, you can get your money back from that original ticket. And this is separate from what you were just talking about with regard to the, the credit cards. Will the airlines uh, honor that? By law, the airlines, U.S. airlines must give you back a full refund if the flight is extremely delayed or canceled. Do not let them give you a voucher, uh, you know, get the cold hard cash and they will honor that. And some have advised booking multiple flights if you're worried about one getting canceled and taking advantage of airlines refundable policy. Is this a strategy that you would use where you'd buy two different flights? You know, if you really have to get somewhere, you can always on a different airline book a separate ticket uh, and just make sure it's changeable or cancelable. Um, so if your original flight is delayed, canceled, you've got a backup option. A lot of, you know, especially using frequent flyer miles, you can cancel those tickets up until departure free of charge. So, you know, it's an extreme tactic, but we're in extreme times right now. But just forget to cancel the flight that you don't end up using or else you won't get your money back. So a lot of people, I think, were at least being hopeful that they thought that some of these headaches would, would end maybe by the end of this week. But you were saying earlier that you think that it'll be the entire month of January. Is that pretty much because of Omicron and weather? Absolutely. You know, we see with Omicron, school districts don't have enough teachers and substitutes. And the same thing's happening for airlines. They simply can't train a flight attendant, uh, you know, in a short amount of time. There's so much safety involved. Same with mechanics. So, uh, you know, the airline industry really needs a breather. And generally after the holiday rush, hopefully if we have good weather, the whole system can sort of reset. But we're not even anywhere close to being out of the woods, especially with Omicron increasing every day and people calling out of work. Uh, we hate to hear that, but we are grateful for the tips. Brian Kelly, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And as we just heard there, of course, we know that life will not begin to stabilize until we can somehow get a grip on COVID. Now to the latest on the coronavirus pandemic this morning, the FDA expanded its emergency use authorization of the Pfizer booster shot to include 12 to 15 year olds as COVID cases rapidly rise across the country. Some schools are now moving to remote learning, at least for now. ABC's Trevor Alt has more. Tonight, millions of students starting the new year back in the classroom with COVID cases exploding. Today, the FDA authorizing Pfizer booster shots for 12 to 15 year olds and regulators now recommending everybody 12 and up originally vaccinated with Pfizer get their booster after five months instead of six. It's more important now than ever for all teens to go out there and get all three of their vaccinations. 
America is now averaging 400,000 cases a day, up a staggering 200 percent in the past two weeks. School districts like Atlanta, Cleveland and Milwaukee switching to remote learning for the time being. But the nation's biggest district, New York City, today welcoming back students in person, handing out upgraded masks and ramping up testing as New York City's new mayor vows to keep kids in the classroom. We are going to keep our schools open. But many parents don't agree. Some refusing to send their kids to school. Others anxious dropping them off this morning. I'm just like worried, really worried for my kid because he has asthma and I have cancer. So, you know, it's like a double whammy. How do you feel coming back to school today? Well, I don't think it's the right decision on the part of the administration. In Chicago, FedEx drop boxes overflowing with return test kits that some parents say couldn't be processed in time for the start of school. How can I let, allow my children to come back and they don't even have a negative or it's a positive result? Testing giant Quest Diagnostics tells ABC recent demand has stretched their average processing time to two or three days, and the testing crunch may only be growing. This line today in Worcester, Massachusetts, crowds including parents and their children braving bitter cold. And tonight, after backlash over the new CDC recommendations cutting isolation time in half to five days with no negative tests needed, Dr. Anthony Fauci now signaling the guidelines are under review yet again. There has been some concern about why we don't ask people at that five-day period to get tested. That is something that is now under consideration. The CDC is very well aware that there has been some pushback about that. Once again, more than 100,000 Americans are now in the hospital with COVID, a number expected to climb. And while some are learning they're positive at the hospital, the vast majority are being treated for the virus. Nearly all in the ICU at New Orleans Children's Hospital are too young to be vaccinated. Sadly, some of them are, gonna, are going to die. And, um, and the tragedy of this is that almost all of those cases that result in hospitalization and death are preventable with vaccination. At Texas Children's, a third of patients are under five, including several babies with COVID. In South Carolina, Tyler Jones and his wife are boosted, but their three-month-old Addison, who's too young to get the vaccine, got sick with COVID New Year's Eve. He woke up in the middle of the night crying and having trouble breathing and he had a fever and we feel helpless because you know your three-month-old can't communicate what hurts i mean there's nothing scarier as a parent you can certainly imagine that our thanks to trevor and there are new developments tonight in the legal case against britain's prince andrew by a woman who accuses him of sexually abusing her after being introduced to him by jeffrey epstein a document was unsealed today that the prince says protects him from that case abc's ariel reshef has the details Tonight, Prince Andrew claiming that newly unsealed $500,000 settlement between Jeffrey Epstein and accuser Virginia Roberts Jufre could be key to getting her civil suit against him thrown out. The 2009 settlement between Epstein and Jufre ending her sex trafficking lawsuit against Epstein filed earlier that year. That suit, not listing names, but containing claims Jufre was sexually exploited by Epstein's adult male peers, including royalty, politicians, academicians, businessmen, and or other professional and personal acquaintances. Prince Andrew's attorneys now arguing that agreement prevents Jufre from suing the prince for alleged sexual abuse because it covers potential defendants from further legal action by her. But Jufre's team saying the royal was not named in the agreement and is not immune. He's still denying it happened. He's just saying that the settlement agreement that was supposed to apply to all potential defendants should apply to him. Epstein died by suicide in his jail cell in 2019. Nearly two years later, Jufre filing a lawsuit against the Queen's son in a New York court, claiming she was trafficked for sex by Epstein and that his friend, Prince Andrew, had sex with her on multiple occasions, claims the prince has vehemently denied. Ariel Reshef joins us now. Ariel, walk us through what happens next. Well, Lindsay, a virtual hearing on Prince Andrew's motion to dismiss Jufre's civil suit against him is scheduled for tomorrow. Prince Andrew's not expected to appear. Lindsay. Ariel, our thanks to you.
Apple keeps growing. The tech giant became the first publicly traded company to reach a market value of $3 trillion. Less than two years ago, it was worth $2 trillion. The company has, in fact, tripled its value in just four years. And while Apple soars, it's time for BlackBerry fans to say goodbye to that once favorite device. What was once arguably the most popular device out there will no longer work as of tomorrow. Any BlackBerry devices not using Android software will no longer be able to make calls, text, or use data to access the internet come Tuesday. RIP, I didn't even realize you could still use Blackberries. We've all experienced looking at a product on online and then going to another website and seeing ads for that same thing. It's called retargeting in the advertising industry, and it does have many consumers concerned about how much companies know about them. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze has the latest on how to protect your privacy online. Most of us are familiar with those annoying pop-up notices when we're on a website asking us to accept cookies to continue navigating the site. So a cookie is a little text file that websites put in your web browser and they can tell everything you've been doing online. Cookies can be a good thing, like when they save your passwords so you can log in quicker or keep track of what's in your virtual shopping cart. These are known as first-party cookies. But there are major privacy concerns with what's called third-party cookies. It's what allows companies to monetize their websites by showing targeted ads or selling information about you. Uh, and it helps pay for the content that we like, but it also ends up spreading your information all over the internet to places you have no idea where it's going. With consumers and regulators getting more concerned about privacy, companies are starting to eliminate their use of third-party cookies, which means fewer instances of your online behavior being tracked and shared across multiple sites. But to make up for the losses in ad income, some companies may start requiring payment to view their websites. Whether that's worth that privacy trade-off is a personal question, but it is something that could happen over the long term. Even though eliminating third-party advertising means your personal data passes through fewer hands, it's important to know that companies will still be using those first-party cookies to collect your data. If you want to better protect your privacy now... One of the choices you can make is switching to a browser like Firefox or a, one called Brave or even using Safari because those all have tools built in to protect your privacy. You can also subscribe to a VPN service or download an ad blocker browser extension. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. Some helpful nuggets there. Thanks to Elizabeth for that. And turning now to pop sensation Ellie Golding. She's now sharing an important message about her personal struggle with anxiety. ABC's Janae Norman has more on the singer's revealing Instagram post. Ellie Golding is opening up about being crippled by anxiety. I'll let you set the, pain. the Love Me Like You Do singer revealing she struggled, quote, daily, nightly, hourly with a kind of panic I didn't even know existed. In a New Year's Eve Instagram post that included this smiling picture, the 34-year-old sharing some of her 2021 highlights, including a new baby, a new book, and performing just weeks ago at Kate Middleton's Christmas concert. From now on, our troubles will be miles away. But also sharing with her 14 million followers, sometimes at my most terrified when I feel there's no escape from the sheer panic and dread in my heart and brain, I remind myself that I can feel. The fact that she had her absolute best year brings great things and it also brings some negatives. The brain starts to say, okay, I've been too out of control. There's too much overload here. And if you have not taken the steps to relax in between, then it's going to bring on that crippling anxiety that she's experiencing. Golding sharing she feels anxiety has helped make her who she is today, but also that she feels like something is broken inside. And she's far from alone. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America reporting an estimated 40 million Americans are diagnosed with some form of anxiety. Golding with a message for those that are in this right now. We're together and we can get through this, most importantly, by talking. Talking. Talking and opening up is the hardest and the best thing you can do. And we're gonna let it burn. 
Our thanks to Janae for that. And still to come, COVID has finally reached the most unlikely of places. We'll explain coming up. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. Where the sky... He put his family, himself, in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Welcome back, everyone. We are tracking several headlines around the world. The parliament in South Africa was spewing smoke and flames once again after catching fire. You can see firefighters spraying water on already damaged portions of the building. Unfortunately, the ceilings belonging to the sites that hosted some of the country's pivotal moments collapsed due to the blaze. We head to Baghdad now, where two drones were shot down at the airport, an attack that coincides with the 2020 killing of a top Iranian general by the U.S. While there were no reports of damage or injuries, an official with a U.S.-led international coalition called it a dangerous attack on a civilian airport, according to the Associated Press, which cited anonymous sources. One of the wings of the drones had the words Soleimani's revenge painted on it, while another had words reading revenge operations for our leaders. And COVID has officially reached one of the most unlikely places, Antarctica. According to the BBC, since mid-December, at least 16 of 25 workers at the Princess Elizabeth Polar Station have caught the virus. Officials told them cases remain mild, and the project manager for the International Polar Foundation said, quote, the situation isn't dramatic. We're happy to hear that. With 2022 now underway, you're already putting into practice, no doubt, those New Year's resolutions from exercising more, eating healthier, finding those new relationships. Resolutions can sometimes be overwhelming. So how do we actually stick to the resolutions that we set? ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi has some guidance for us all. 
We've all been here before. You make your New Year's resolution, but then you give up just a few months in. Dr. Ayelet Fishback, professor at the University of Chicago and author of Get It Done, has some tips on setting and achieving your resolutions for 2022. First, Dr. Fishback says it's important to set the right goal. We often find that it's better if the goal is, is enticing, if it is intrinsically uh, motivating. Setting your goal as finding a job is better than setting it as applying for a job because applying for a job is, is a chore. It's not very enticing. Aim for a do goal versus a do not goal. So we distinguish between do goals, for example, to eat healthier food and do not goals, which could be do not eat junk food. In general, do goals are easier to, to follow. Setting a goal like be happy is too abstract since we might not know what to do about it. Instead, consider goals like start a relationship or help others. Things are not going to always work as we uh, we plan. Try to consider what obstacles you might run into so you're better prepared when you hit a roadblock. Maybe you should add something that's fun. So when we uh, uh, ask gym uh, uh, goers to uh, uh, incorporate more fun to their exercise, they were more likely to stick with it. And when you get stuck, remember what you've already achieved. Give yourself the advice you'd give to others and think about why you got stuck so you can improve your strategy and move forward. Mona Kosarabdi, ABC News, New York. Focus on the do's instead of the don'ts like that advice. Our thanks to Mona for that. Just short of a miracle happened this New Year's Eve, or you could really say two miracles. Two newborn babies were born not only on two different days, but two different months and two different years. Will Gans has a story. The odds of having twins, roughly one in 250. Like I never thought in a million years I would thought that I was gonna have twins. The odds of having twins born on two different days, in two different months, in two different years? I was in shock at first, but I was so happy and I feel so relieved. Um, I was just surprised. It was just so, it's a blessing. Alfredo Antonio, born at 11.45 p.m. on December 31st, 2021. 15 minutes later, his twin sister Eileen Yolanda, born at exactly midnight, January 1st, 2022. That's right, Alfredo and Eileen technically born in different years. A one in two million chance. Both mom and dad and the extended family shocked. So we are like surprised because neither of us have family with twins. The twins' doctor saying in a statement, this was definitely one of the most memorable deliveries of my career. It was an absolute pleasure to help these little ones arrive here safely in 2021 and 2022. What an amazing way to start the new year. The Miracle Twins recovering back home. Oh That's the girl. <laughs> She's beautiful. Hi, Eileen. Fatima saying she's honored her newborn boy and girl can be a sign of hope as we bring in the new year. Everything is possible and every child's a blessing. Miracle babies are thanks to Will for that and congratulations to the family. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.